much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I normally say what a pleasure it is for me to rise and debate on a specific piece of legislation before the House. And that is the case because I do uh, enjoy talking public policy. But it would be, uh, I would be amiss if I didn't comment on why we're debating C55 today. Um, in fact, I also feel bad for our table officers and our parliamentary clerks and everyone trying to support debate in the House because it's been a bit sporadic over the last number of days and all due to one simple reason, the fact that the government, uh, which ran on slogans of accountability, uh, transparency, uh, has been desperate to not provide those two things to the opposition with respect to the Atwal India affair. Um, we wouldn't be debating C-55 at all today, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be speaking for some time, so I think my colleagues will, will see that I'm ready for the debate. Um, but we wouldn't be debating this at all were the government willing to be accountable. The same level of, of disclosure provided to the media, be that classified or, or non-classified, very hard to determine after today's question period, uh, MPs should be entitled to that same thing. And in a ruling from your chair earlier today, Mr. Speaker, you confirmed that MPs collectively and individually are entitled to hear from Mr. Jean, but there needs to be an order of parliament in order to facilitate that appearance. Normally, a committee that calls upon him uh, to, to provide testimony, to appear. But when a government uses its majority to block Mr. Jean, to block the ability for parliament to exercise that order, um, they are stifling debate, covering up the Atwal affair, what, whatever you want to call it, Mr. Speaker. They, they can't suggest that, uh, that they're not violating our rights to get to the heart of the matter um, based on the fact they're using their majority to squash proper scrutiny of the major diplomatic incident. So I say that at the outset because I, I want Canadians following this debate both in our galleries but at, at home to recognize we're debating C-55 amendments to the Oceans Act and the Canadian Petroleum Resources Act because the government is desperate to keep the National Security Advisor, Daniel Jean, from answering a few simple questions and providing the same level of information he provided journalists. What I find curious from today's question period is the Prime Minister and the Minister of Public Safety suggest that none of the information he gave is classified, yet a member of the press gallery during question period confirmed that the National Security Advisor said that certain pieces of information could not be shared publicly that he was sharing, or they couldn't write about it. So that would suggest the contrary, Mr. Speaker. This is like an onion. Every level we peel away uh, is another layer and our eyes are watering, Mr. Speaker, uh, with tears for the lack of accountability of this government, to keep with that analogy, Mr. Speaker. But now getting to the heart of the matter and Bill C-55. And what may look to Canadians as sort of an update to, to an act, I'm going to suggest to you is the creeping edge of ideological liberal uh, uh, policy and ideology creeping in to uh, the science of our oceans and to our economic relationships with companies that invest capital to develop resources in the offshore, Mr. Speaker. And I'll speak to that in a moment. But overall, the, the bill is suggested as empowering and clarifying how the minister can establish uh, marine protected spaces and to provide a national network of those. And that has been done before, Mr. Speaker. Um, but I would suggest with this bill, they, they take a very ideological turn. Um, the bill contains new powers for enforcement officers, uh, new offenses for ships and, and operators that violate uh, nationally protected marine areas, Mr. Speaker. What is also contained in the bill tells you where they're really going with this, Mr. Speaker, and it provides for the ability to cancel interests, be they economic or other, uh, in a marine area. Uh, petrological investigation and, and, and development, Mr. Speaker, I think is what meant by that, and to compensate for it. So already they're going to be, uh, they're signaling that they intend to basically pull back on some of the offshore licenses that many companies have, Mr. Speaker, and I would suggest members from uh, Atlantic Canada who are already suffering greatly uh, 
from the Prime Minister's move to try and uh, increase the regulation that led to the cancellation of Energy East. I know my friend from St. John had, has watched that closely. Um, they're already hurting the energy industry in Atlantic Canada. And now, have they consulted Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, Mr. Speaker? Because we have provincial federal boards to regulate the offshore. The Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and one created for Newfoundland and Labrador. I would add, Mr. Speaker, that all of the work with respect to allowing provinces to be a net beneficiary of their offshore petroleum wealth, much like the onshore in, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even in Ontario, Petroleum Ontario at one point, Mr. Speaker, all of that security for those Atlantic provinces provided by Conservative governments, Mr. Speaker, which don't try and chase away investment from the energy industry, Mr. Speaker, try to make sure Canada benefits to the full extent that our royalty regimes will allow, and to make sure that areas like St. John, New Brunswick, uh, like Halifax, like St. John's in Newfoundland and Labrador have employment benefit and secondary and tertiary benefit from the offshore, Mr. Speaker. It was the governments of Brian Mulroney and Stephen Harper that provided that. I was proud to learn all about that at, at Atlantic Canada's finest law school, Mr. Speaker, Dalhousie Law School, where we studied that approach to the offshore. So this bill, C-55, already indicates they're going to be pulling a lot of these economic rights back, Mr. Speaker. And the members from Atlantic Canada who should already be worried about the government's move to, to ensure Energy East didn't happen, the war on small business, uh, which I know my friend in St. John watched very closely because he publicly criticized his government on that. There's a war on job creation in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker, and I see Bill C-55 as the latest arsenal in the Liberal government's attempt to stymie the ability for Atlantic Canada to benefit from their offshore resources. Um, there's a number of other measures in the bill, Mr. Speaker. It does, interestingly, exclude uh, First Nations organizations that may have uh, uh, agreements uh, as, opposed, as part of a lands claim treaty, Mr. Speaker. So if they're really doing this in the public interest, um, I'm wondering why there would be that exclusion, Mr. Speaker. I think our First Nations would, would want to know that they were being consulted and, and being part of the decision related to marine integrity, Mr. Speaker. Finally, um, there are obvious exemptions for search and rescue and uh, scientific research and uh, damage response that would allow first responders and others to, to uh, go into marine protected spaces. And I say that, Mr. Speaker, because the odd time I get to speak in the House about my own uh, experience in that regard, when I was with the Sea King squadrons in Atlantic Canada, 423 Squadron, we deployed with our Atlantic Navy. We went out into these economic, our ex economic exclusive zone, Mr. Speaker, to the fisheries patrol in the Grand Banks and the Flemish Cap. Uh, my crew, we landed on Hibernia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, hundreds of nautical miles from St. John's because we had to train to prepare for evacuations uh, and responses to, to, um, to tragedy. And Newfoundland and Labrador know that from the sad Ocean Ranger tragedy, Mr. Speaker. So developing a resource and the jobs related to the offshore has its risks, Mr. Speaker. And I've seen that firsthand. But I've also, from living in Atlantic Canada and serving in that role, I've seen firsthand how the economic activity in, for example, St. John's and the outports along the Avalon benefit from this resource development, Mr. Speaker. C-55 is the plan to stop that, Mr. Speaker, to pull back licenses, the ability for these resources to be developed responsibly, Mr. Speaker. I think. We're debating this now because of the cover-up in the Atwal affair, but I'm hoping shining a light on C-55 allows some of the Atlantic caucus to speak up to the Prime Minister and say, enough is enough, Mr. Prime Minister. We're already going to see jobs at risk in the energy industry impacted by your cancellation of Energy East because of 
the burdens you've put on TransCanada and other operators. Now with this, are you forecasting more cuts in offshore, uh, offshore oil and gas exploration, Mr. Speaker? I hope our friends, particularly my friend from St. John, ask those tough questions at caucus, Mr. Speaker, because C-55 seems to signal that. The ideological underpinnings here that really concern me is, can be found in sections uh, 35 and 35.1 of the Act, Mr. Speaker, because it appears to integrate directly the precautionary principle into uh, these pieces of legislation, Mr. Speaker, and that should cause some debate because those sections basically say that you cannot use scientific uncertainty regarding risks or regarding uh, marine uh, uh, health, that sort of thing, as a reason to be cautious with respect to regulation or to phase in or to not have regulation until there is scientific certainty. The precautionary principle, which clearly some ideological adherents in the Liberal Party want to push forward is, before the science is even clear, let's regulate and remove activity. That's what that says, Mr. Speaker. You know, some call it the better safe than sorry uh, philosophy, but it's actually not, Mr. Speaker, because acting before you have the science will have unintended risks, especially and there's been learned scholars write about this, especially when it comes to economic activity. You're going to hurt economic activity because you're leaning in favor of stopping something before the science is even clear, Mr. Speaker. Now, as, as a Conservative MP that had the pleasure of being in government for a short time, including in Cabinet, and now uh, we're on our way back there, Mr. Speaker, but we're on this side, one thing I remember clearly was the Prime Minister at the time, his love for expressions that they were evidence-based decision-making. They were going to be a science-led government. They were going to unshackle science, Mr. Speaker. Well, here in this bill, it should concern Canadians that they're actually saying, no, we're not going to wait for the science at all, Mr. Speaker. We're going to regulate. We're going to stop development. We're going to stop technological improvement that could address some of the issues at play before the science is confirmed. People have written how the precautionary principle, if it's, if it's mandated, will lead to economic disruption, will stifle technological innovation, Mr. Speaker, and you haven't actually assessed the situation properly. So you're going to run into unintended risks because you're leaning forward without a proper assessment of the science. Now, the good thing is, the way environmental legislation already reads is it generally will regulate where there is science. It doesn't have to be absolutely certain, but the way legislation generally in, in Canada, in the United States, other countries, has been able to regulate in a way that's minimally intrusive, particularly while the science is uncertain. And I'm not just making this up, Mr. Speaker. These are sections that they are inserting in to two acts of parliament that already exist. I don't think the Liberals could suggest there's no regulation of the environment in our oceans. They're, they're acknowledging the Oceans Act and the Petroleum Resources Act exist to do this. They're going further by inserting this ideological approach to governing. That should concern people, especially my friends in Atlantic Canada, who would like the Liberal government for a change to lean in favour of jobs, Mr. Speaker. They lean in favour of stopping investment. And don't just take my word for it, Mr. Speaker. We, we remember the famous and, and mildly embarrassing speech the Prime Minister gave introducing President Obama in this chamber. You know, a hallowed ground where once Winston Churchill gave his some chicken, some neck speech. The Prime Minister introduced the President of the United States by saying the press gallery and Canadians were going to witness a bromance in action. Dude diplomacy, as he termed it. I wanted to crawl under the table at that moment, Mr. Speaker. I was so embarrassed by our Prime Minister. But what did President Obama's 
chief official from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs say about inserting the precautionary principle in legislation? Here's what he said, quote, the precautionary principle is for all its rhetorical appeal deeply incoherent, end quote, Mr. Speaker. He acknowledges that it is policy on the fly so that people could feel good without clear science, Mr. Speaker. We have the ability to have science in terms of the impact of resource development, how to mitigate that. We have science with respect to fisheries, to marine life. Why would we not consult the science? They are inserting into legislation the ability for government to ignore the science and stop first. Stop and ask questions later, Mr. Speaker. I think, particularly in Atlantic Canada, that should concern a number of people. There has been criticism of this approach because it's inserting ideological value judgments in place of sound public policy supported by science. The interesting thing is so many of the Liberal candidates, I'm sure the members listening to my speech, probably repeated that evidence-based decision-making line. That was one of the Liberals' top hits from the election campaign, Mr. Speaker. Where is that now? By incorporating the precautionary principle into legislation, they are saying we're making a value judgment, their value judgment, rather than consulting the science. That should concern people, Mr. Speaker, and I, I hope people see that in C-55. They might think it's innocuous. This is ideological creep of the Liberal government. And we see that everywhere. I've said this is a government that in NAFTA negotiations didn't mention the auto industry or other core sectors of the economy. They said their priorities were going to be Indigenous issues, environmental issues, a number of things that aren't even contained in the rules of origin, the market access provisions of a trade agreement. I termed that at the time, Mr. Speaker, virtue signaling. They will say, here are our values. Who cares what the science is? Who cares what the trade agreement is? We only want to speak to a certain number of voters, and we're willing to change legislation. We're willing to prioritize trade negotiation 